Tel Aviv University, which is a place uh, that I've always deeply admired and to me represents um, so much of the best of Israel. Um, there are many people, um, including some of my own family, um, who think I spend far too much time uh, bashing Israel. So um, uh, for um, uh, today, I will bash my own country, the United States. Um, um, so perhaps that'll be a, 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 a welcome break for some. Um, yeah. Um, so um, five years ago, if you had told uh, an American that Donald Trump would be president of the United States and that his re-election opponent might be a self-declared socialist, they would have thought you had lost your mind. Um, so how did American politics in a relatively short period of time appear to go crazy? That's what I want to talk about. And one way to think about it is through a, uh, a distinction that I think was very helpful made a few years ago in a book by the MSNBC host, uh, Chris Hayes, who said you could divide American politicians into two groups, which he calls institutionalists and insurrectionists. And you find both of them in both parties. So the institutionalists believe the foundations of American government and the American economy are basically sound. Sure, things can be improved, but we should make changes, but the system works more or less. Jeb and George W. Bush are institutionalists. Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama are also institutionalists. The other group are insurrectionists. They believe that the American government and economy are fundamentally rotten. Our government is corrupt and works to help the powerful and pretty much screw everyone else. Our economy is pretty much the same. Our democracy is mostly a sham. Washington is a swamp. We need some kind of nonviolent revolution to tear things down and start again. Donald Trump is an insurrectionist. Bernie Sanders is an insurrectionist. To a slightly lesser degree, so is Elizabeth Warren. Yes. Okay. Okay. It's okay. The sound. Okay. Um, so, what's happened over the last two decades is that a series of events has shifted power in both parties, from institutionalists to insurrectionists. From the people who think things are basically okay and just need to be changed kind of around the edges to people who think that they're basically rotten. And that has allowed people like Trump and Sanders and Warren to go from being kind of political freaks to virtually taking over their political parties. So what happened to, 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 to make this shift occur? Basically, the government and the economy kept failing, and that created a crisis of, a crisis of faith in the system as it is. Hayes calls the period between 2000 and 2010 the fail decade. And in many, much of what we are dealing with politically, I think, are the aftershocks of those failures. First, the U.S. government uh, failed to prevent the September 11th attacks. Then it res responded to those attacks with two costly wars in Iraq and Afghanistan that the United States didn't win. Then it couldn't protect the people of New Orleans from Hurricane Katrina. Okay? Yeah. Um, um, uh, I was worried that this is a commentary on the content, not just the volume. Um, uh, then came the worst financial crisis and economic downturn since the Great Depression. And you can see the results in Poland. So in the mid-1960s, Pollsters began asking Americans whether they trusted the government to do the right thing all or most of the time. And back then in the mid-1960s, about 75% of Americans said yes, that the government does the right thing all or most of the time. After Watergate and Vietnam, that declined substantially. And by the year 2000, it was at about 40%. 40% of Americans told pollsters that the government does the right thing all or most of the time. But since the fail decade, since 2010, that number has been regularly below 20%. There's not a single poll that I've seen actually since the Great Recession, the financial crisis of 2007, 2008, where it has hit 30%. So in both the Republican and Democratic parties, insurrectionists started telling a story to explain these failures, and institutionalists couldn't respond very well. First, they couldn't respond very well because their general orientation is that government in the economy works reasonably well. So it was hard to explain all of this failure. 
And secondly, the institutionalists had mostly been in government themselves and therefore were implicated in these failures. And if you look, again, you think about the kind of the long aftershocks of this, right? That if you watch the last Democratic debate, Bernie Sanders was still attacking Joe Biden over his vote for the Iraq War, right? Even though that happened in 2002, which is 18 years ago, right? That was the, yet the first thing Sanders said when he was asked about the current crisis with Iran was to go back to that 18 years ago, right? So we see the, in many ways the way we are living with the aftershocks of the failures of the first decade of the 21st century. But the Republican and Democratic insurrectionist arguments about what went wrong are different. For Republican insurrectionists like Trump, the problem is globalism. That's what explains these failures. And for Democratic insurrectionists like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, the problem is capitalism, or at least capitalism as currently practiced in the United States. So let me talk about the Republican insurrectionist argument first, and then the Democratic insurrectionist argument. So in 2016, Trump noticed something as he started to run for president. He noticed that his Republican presidential opponents, who were mainly institutionalists, had supported the Iraq War and the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, and China's admission into the World Trade Organization, and they continued to be fairly supportive of an expansive overseas American military presence and free trade deals and immigration rates that were high enough to demographically transform the United States. And he also noticed that Republican voters were very unhappy with the direction of the United States and that they distrusted their party's own leaders. And so he put these two things together, and he said basically that the reason the country was going in the wrong direction was that the elites of both parties, not just the Democrats, but also his Republican elite opponents, were putting foreigners ahead of Americans. They were, they were getting Americans killed in wars that benefited other countries or paying a lot for military bases that supposedly benefited other countries, but not the United States ripped off in trade deals that helped China and Mexico, but hurt ordinary Americans. And they were letting in lots of immigrants who supposedly took jobs and caused crime and made America unrecognizable. And I think the reason this worked so well in the Republican primary was that Trump realized that the base of the Republican Party was older white people, especially older white men, many of whom had come of age in the middle of the 20th century. And in the middle of the 20th century, America had very little immigration. If you're familiar with the history of American immigration, the United States largely cut off immigration in the early 1920s and didn't really open the doors up in a significant way again until 1965. So the memory that these, um, these older Americans had a memory of an America where the foreign-born population was much lower. And in the mid-20th century, the US was far less economically globalized. Companies couldn't as easily move overseas, and there was much less foreign competition because the rest of the world was still mostly economically flat on its back after World War II. And in the mid-20th century, the U.S. was still basking in the glow of its victory in World War II. And in the mid-20th century, hierarchies of identity between whites and blacks, between men and women, between Christians and non-Christians were much clearer than they are today. So Trump promised a return to that earlier, less globalized America in which people didn't lose their jobs to foreign competition and you didn't have signs in foreign languages <coughs> and America wasn't losing wars and people knew their place in the hierarchies. And for a lot of his supporters, that's what he meant by make America great again. <coughs> and Obama was his perfect foil because Obama was black and the child of an immigrant who had lived abroad and represented this new multicultural globalized America. And now with Obama gone, you see that Trump's foils are people like Ilhan Omar and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who are either immigrants or people of color or both. Generally, Trump chooses as his foils also women. Um, uh, and they're people who can be made to embody the assault on this idealized mid 20th century America that Trump is claiming to defend. And Trump defends, def devotes a lot of energy and creativity to finding ways of evoking these threats to this mythic mid 20th century America. So when he calls, even when he's dealing with people who are white, right, he finds ways in some ways of trying, associating them with these threats. So when he calls Elizabeth Warren 
Pocahontas, for instance, or when he tweets out, as he did last week, a photo of Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi, the Democratic leaders in the Senate and House, in Islamic clothing, right? He's finding ways of making them represent this cultural, religious, racial threat. And in peddling this apocalyptic vision of what happened to this idealized America, Trump gained credibility in 2016 because some things, really big things, really had gone wrong, and his institutionalist opponents wouldn't admit it. So Trump said the Iraq War had been a disaster, which was true, which was something the institutionalist Republicans weren't saying. And he said that American politics was corrupt, which was also true. And this gave him credibility among people who had lost faith in the system. Now, the Democratic insurrectionist story is different. It's not that globalism has ruined America, it's that deregulated capitalism has ruined America. And it also has a strong element of nostalgia, which is maybe not surprising that if you see a history, in some ways, a, a, great, a great power that is in decline, it's not surprising that you would have a politics that had strong elements of nostalgia, both on the left and right for a period, especially right after World War II, where the gap between America and all its competitors was so much larger than it is. So the democratic insurrectionist argument is that in the mid 20th century, America was more economically equal, labor unions were stronger, taxes on the rich were higher, a lot of families could support themselves on one paycheck, people had stable jobs with good... Now, Interestingly, one of the big challenges for both Sanders and Warren, narrative-wise, has been to tell this story of American kind of decline, economic decline, with an element of nostalgia for the 1950s, right? Without, right, I mean, with, while still uh, appealing to people of color, right? Who, of course, in a lot of ways are not going to be drawn to a narrative which suggests that things were better in the 1950s. This is, in some ways, if you look at the speeches and the TV commercials and the narrative, Warren and, and Sanders are always trying to kind of play with this story of how to incorporate a story of basically what they see as the decline of the strong American middle class, right? Which is a story that works for white, a lot of white Americans and yet fiddle with the narrative so they're always trying, not signaling to African Americans that basically we're erasing you, or we're trying to make it seem like, for, for Trump, of course, in some ways, that's exactly the point, right? But, but Warren and Sanders actually have to try to appeal to African American and women and gay voters, other people who won't necessarily think the 1950s were better, even if labor unions did have higher participation rates. Um, but the narrative, the, the democratic insurrectionist narrative is that starting in the 1970s, uh, corporations started attacking this welfare state, Ronald Reagan slashed regulations, uh, and taxes for the rich and attack labor unions and push trade deals that hurt workers. And so the share of the pie going to the middle and working class grew smaller and smaller. And these corporations and rich people eviscerated the campaign finance rules, so it became easier to buy politicians, which made American politics more corrupt. If you watch Elizabeth Warren's announcement video, which is a, a good document to watch, it's basically entirely this historical story. And just accused institutionalist Republicans of being complicit in this story of decline because they had supported trade deals and immigration and foreign wars, Sanders accused institutionalist Democrats like Hillary Clinton and now Joe Biden of being complicit because they supported NAFTA and deregulation, in the case of Hillary Clinton, gave speeches to Goldman Sachs. And whilst Trump's arguments appeal particularly to older Americans who were unnerved by the cultural changes brought by immigration and feminism, Sanders and Warren appeal to the young who came of age in the wake of the Great Recession and feel that capitalism has failed them because they have large student debts and can't get stable jobs and decent benefits. And this rise of insurrectionists in both parties also explains, I think, why there's an increasing challenge to the rules of the game in American politics. That the rules that govern political competition between the two parties have been to a significant degree, degree been delegitimized in both parties. Understanding this increasing delegitimization of the rules, which I fear potentially could come to, to a head this November uh, with, with this, this year's election, is that Amer the American political is to be very crude on two broad and contradictory principles, right? One of those principles is democracy, the other is white supremacy. And the American political system is a blend of these two things. 
But America's demographic transformation, the rising population of non-white people, has made democracy more of a threat to white supremacy. And so Republicans have moved more aggressively to delegitimize certain more democratic aspects of the American political system um, that, uh, and impede political participation by people of color. This began before Donald Trump, but he has accelerated it. So he, of course, famously claimed that Barack Obama wasn't born in the United States, and he's now said that non-white lawmakers like Ilhan Omar and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez should go home. He wanted to change the census to include a question on immigration to try to drive down participation rates among Latinos and other immigrants. And last week, and this was a really, I thought, fascinating kind of document of our moment, there was a, a, a lawsuit in the state of Florida. Florida um, had rules that basically made it very, very difficult if you were committed, convicted of a felony to vote even after you left prison, which disproportionately impacted African Americans. And, and that was overturned in a referendum, but the governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis, who's a kind of a Trump acolyte, has tried to block the implementation of this to make it much harder for felons even to vote even once they leave prison. And in his statement about why it shouldn't be easy for them to get their voting rights restored, he said that, quote, voting is a privilege, right? Not, not a right, right? Which I think, again, in some ways, in some ways, you know, Michael Kinsley famously said in, in, in politics, a gaffe is when you tell the truth, right? That he was actually articulating something which is more and more, I think, the ethos in much of the Republican Party. And in the, on the Democratic side, the insurrectionist Democrats are all challenging long-established the ones that they feel are impeding democracy and maintaining white supremacy. So there's more and more talk about increasing the size of the Supreme Court. I think one of the things that we would, could well see, if the Democrats are able, it's a big if, the Democrats are able to win this fall, and, and this is an even bigger if, able to pass significant legislation, right, which is very, would be very difficult given that you effectively need 60 votes in the South, you well could have a situation in American politics we haven't seen really since the 1930s, I think, in which you have a progressive president and Congress try, running up against a conservative Supreme Court, especially if Trump can get another vote on that court. And that will, I think, accelerate the voices that you're already starting to hear in the Democratic Party. Again, this was not something that was discussed at all a decade ago, which is talking about increasing the size of the Supreme Court or changing the way that Supreme Court justices are chosen because it's seen as an anti-democratic mechanism. The other thing you're hearing much more conversation about than you did before is abolishing the Electoral College among Democratic insurrectionists, again, because this is seen as a way of essentially uh, undermining an anti-democratic mechanism in the American political, uh, in the American political system. Um, um, uh, so no matter who wins in, in 2020, I think it's for ver because the rules of the game of American politics are being delegitimized. Democrats increasingly see the Electoral College as illegitimate. Republicans, in many ways, well, they don't quite come out and say it, see the political participation of people of color as illegitimate, right? You saw this back in 2016. If you remember, before the election, Trump essentially kept on saying in various ways, if I lose, it will be because millions of illegal immigrants or millions of people in places like Philadelphia have voted who didn't deserve to vote, right? So as, just as Democrats are delegitimizing a victory based on the Electoral College, Republicans delegitimizing a victory based on the political participation of people of color who are often perceived as non-citizens or some white people who f commit voter fraud. Um, so what does this mean uh, for, 20, for this actual election? Let me talk a little bit about the candidates since we're only a few weeks now from the first voting. Um, so Joe Biden is a classic institutionalist, maybe the last classic institutionalist really with a lot, with a lot of power in either party or the chance to get uh, And that's a big reason that he's just getting absolutely destroyed by Bernie Sanders among younger Democrats who tend to be the most insurrectionist. The key for him is African American voters who are somewhat less insurrectionist than white voters, certainly less insurrectionist than young 
white millennial voters, although it's worth noting that there's also a big age gap among African Americans as well, where Sanders does much better among young African Americans and much better among younger Latinos, and, Trump, and Biden does, does extraordinarily well among older African Americans and older Latinos. Um, and African Americans, I think, are less insurrectionist in part because they've seen at least one thing, big thing, go right during this failed decade, which was the election of Barack Obama. And Joe Biden, as Obama's vice president, has a lot of goodwill. And African Americans, I think, are also more pessimistic or more pragmatic, you might say, about how willing white Americans will be to vote for a left-wing candidate in the general election. Um, Biden's problem is to get to the South Carolina primary, the fourth state that votes where a majority of the Democratic voters are African American. He first has to survive Iowa and New Hampshire, which are very white states. He's holding his own, I think, actually better than a lot of people might have thought. But he has less money, by some accounts, a less effective organization on the ground, which particularly matters in Iowa, than Sanders and Warren and Buttigieg do. And he probably can't afford to lose both early states to the same person. Buttigieg is um, the kind of last best hope for institutionalists, people who don't want to blow up the political and economic system, but who've kind of given up on Biden because I think he's past his prime, which is part of the reason so many big money Democrats have gotten behind Buttigieg's campaign. Um, in a way, you know, he's too young to be implicated. In, he's in some ways a good kind of institutionalist because he's too young to have been actually implicated in the failures that took place in the first decade of the 20th century. And as a gay man, he represents extraordinary cultural progress, but he doesn't represent a fundamental challenge to American capitalism in the way that Sanders and Warren do. I think you can see Buttigieg in a way as a kind of a American version of French President Emmanuel Macron, who also was young and came out of nowhere, but whose freshness of persona masked the fact that he wasn't actually fundamentally proposing to change the political economic system in fundamental ways. Buttigieg's problem is that although he does well with older and moderate white voters, essentially Buttigieg is extremely young, but does, not, does very well with, with older white voters. Sanders is older than Methuselah, but does very poorly among older white voters and very well among younger voters. Um, Buttigieg's problem, in beyond the fact that he doesn't do that well among young white voters, he's doing terribly among African Americans and Latinos. And, and, and for institutionalists in general, the problem is that Buttigieg and Biden are splitting the institutionalist vote, just like Warren and Sanders are splitting the insurrectionist vote. Now, the third institutionalist in the race, significant institutionalist, you could say, I'm not talking about Amy Klobuchar, although we, we could if you want in questions, um, is, is Michael Bloomberg. Um, uh, and if, who's, who, as you may know, is skipping the first four states, but spending an absolutely unprecedented amount of money in the states that come later. And if Biden and Buttigieg both collapse in the early states, and especially if Sanders looks like he's on the path to potentially getting the nomination, you could see Bloomberg with his unlimited money becoming a kind of last gasp for the institutionalists. Um, and if the race does come down to Bloomberg and Sanders, I think that will be um, uh, in some ways really a disaster for the Democratic Party because the d ideological divide will be so great that I think it'll be hard to put the unify the party again. Um, so can any of these people beat Donald Trump? The answer is yes, they can beat Donald Trump. It doesn't mean they will beat Donald Trump, but Donald Trump's approval ratings have been extremely consistent in the low 40s, which by historical standards for a president seeking re-election is quite low. It's significantly lower than what you would think it would be given the unemployment rate. Um, Trump's, Trump's underperforming the American economy in terms of his approval pretty significantly. Now, it's possible to win re-election if your approval rating is below 50%. George H.W. Bush did it in 1988. Obama did it in 2012, even though their approval ratings were a little bit below 50%. But a president with Trump's approval ratings can't win by making the, the election a referendum on his first four years, like Reagan famously did in 1984 with the slogan, you know, uh, are you better off than you were four years ago? Uh, someone with an approval rating as low as Trump has to delegitimize their opponent so that some group of voters who don't like him will like the Democrat even less. He has to show some group of swing voters that as disruptive and unpleasant as he is, the Democrats are worse, and that's why you're probably going to hear him talking constantly about 
The Democrats is representing anti-American socialists who want to eliminate America's borders and turn the United States into Venezuela. Venezuela, by the way, is not chosen at random, right, as an example of the socialist countries that Donald Trump could choose in the world. It has a lot more residents than, say, Denmark, right, uh, if you're trying to talk about people who are afraid of cultural change and demographic change in the United States. Um, um, I have no idea uh, who's going to win, um, but I do think that it is like it, it, there's a good chance that whoever wins, that the results could be somewhat destabilizing. Um, if Trump wins, it's likely he will win the electoral college again without winning the popular vote. And there's been some, some number crunching that's shown that because of the distribution of votes, he could actually lose by a lot, he could lose the popular vote by a larger margin than he did in 2016. He lost by a pretty significant margin in the popular vote in 2016 and yet still win the electoral college. I think it's more likely Trump wins the, wins the election and loses the popular vote than that he wins the electoral college and wins the popular vote. And that would mean that three of the last four Republican presidential victories had occurred with a minority of the popular vote and that will be a very radicalizing experience for Democrats. Um, and, a delegit and it will be delegitimizing for, for Trump and for the entire America, way America chooses presidents. As I mentioned before, if Democrats win, right, if Democrats win, um, the, the Trump Twitter feed, right, will be, um, will be truly historically important to watch in those moments. And I think it's a very, very good bet that at the very least, Trump will make some gestures towards not accepting the results of the election with some tweets about how there are voter irregularities and illegal immigrants and blah, 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 right? The question is, I think, really, what happens inside the government and inside the public sphere and in the public sphere in response to those tweets, right? Um, what do cons Republican senators say, right? What does Sean Hannity say? Um, what do people inside, what does Trump's chief of staff do, right? Do they basically res intervene and say, no, this isn't kosher? Or do they basically give Trump something of a green light? I don't think it's impossible to imagine a situation in which ultimately this plays itself out for a while. And what ultimately ends the standoff is some kind of statement by the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which is to say, we as the American military respect the results of the election. And that would be, um, you know, truly astonishing in some ways, right, um, in the United States. And yet ultimately, uh, uh, we, they are the ones who control the guns. Um, and I think it's, it's conceivable that at the end of the day, that's what it might take ultimately. Um, Trump stand down. Um, and I say all this because I think one of the things that Americans have a lot of trouble doing is seeing ourselves in comparative historical perspective. And so there is a talk in the United States about how Trump's rising authoritarianism has parallels to what you see in Brazil with Bolsonaro or Hungary with Orban or India with Modi. And yet there's still, I think, often a kind of a condescending kind of discussion which suggests, well, you look, you know, look, Hungary, Brazil, these are new, young, fledgling democracies. Of course, they're somewhat unstable, but we, the United States, have been a democracy for such a long time that although Trump is, is dangerous in some ways, our democracy is, 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 because it's so old, it's not susceptible to the same threats. But I think one of the things that, um, with the exception of African-American writers and, and, and scholars, people don't focus enough nearly enough in the popular American discussion is that as an experiment in multiracial democracy, America is not really very much older than Brazil is as a democracy, right? Brazil, I think, ended military rule in the 1960s. America became a democracy in which people of color could participate politically at the same time. And as an experiment in multiracial democracy where black and brown people actually can seriously contest for power, we are even younger than that. And I think we are realizing how fledgling and how fragile an experiment in multiracial democracy America really is. So I'll stop there and answer some questions. Thanks. The question for those who didn't hear it is that, um, um, that national approval ratings uh, are, are not as important as approval ratings in key states.
um, because, of course, the, the way the American political system works is that each state votes. It has a number of electors, which are the combination, which are which are based on the number of members of Congress it has, right? The number of senators plus House members, which gives slightly more weight to smaller states, since all the states have two uh, senators. Um, and yes, that's true. Um, the um, what you find um, in the in kind of the key in key Midwestern states. Um, so the re Hillary, Trump won the election in part by breaking through what was called the Democratic kind of blue wall that was supposed to be these industrial Midwestern states, Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, and Pennsylvania in particular. You do find that Trump, I mean, I haven't looked at the numbers recently. I think Trump's rating, uh, approval ratings in those states are slightly higher than they are, um, than they are nationally. And I think one of the things that Democrats do worry about um, is that particularly Wisconsin um, is a demographically quite problematic state for Democrats and a state that would be, the, the nightmare scenario for Democrats is that you have, the reason Wisconsin in particular is bad, right, is that in, 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 Wisco, in, in Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, you have, Democrats do best with people of color, right, and with white voters who have college degrees, right? So in those Midwestern states, those industrial Midwestern states, you have a higher percentage of the white population without college degrees, right? Who tend to be uh, who tend to be harder for Democrats to win. And the particular problem in Wisconsin is that you also have a smaller uh, African American and Latino population, right? The African American population in Wisconsin, concentrated around Milwaukee, is not as high a percentage of the state as the African American population in Michigan, concentrated around Detroit and other places, or Philadelphia in uh, in in, uh, in in Pennsylvania. So Wisconsin is considered to be a particularly challenging state for Democrats. The danger for, now there are other states that demographically in the Southwest, for instance, like Arizona, even potentially Texas whose rising Latino population, right, makes them potentially states that could be put in play for Democrats. Uh, Democrats had a good year in Arizona in 2018. I think the fear, the danger for Democrats is that they fall in between these two poles, which is to say they're, they're, that Arizona and Texas have not demographically evolved to a point where Democrats can win, and yet they're still falling short. And there's an inter there was an um, it was a very interesting poll that was done over the summer. If you, any of you are kind of junkies of this, you might have followed it by Nate Cohn in the New York Times. Actually, an intervention that actually I think really hurt Elizabeth Warren. Um, but they, they, the New York Times went to extraordinary lengths to try to model the electorate in the United States, which is very, very difficult to do in polling because response rates are very, very low. And non-college educated voters are particularly unlikely to, to, to respond, right? So they, anyway, but the, the time to great lengths in those industrial Midwestern states to try to find voters who don't respond to polls. And what they claimed when they did so was that those, those pollsters, those people who are difficult to poll in those Midwestern are more likely to voters. And that the polling might be underestimating Trump's support. Not interestingly in a state like Texas and Arizona, where some of the very difficult people to reach are actually Latino voters who might actually, who would vote Democrat. But in the mid, upper Midwestern states, the polls might be underestimating um, Demo uh, Trump support. And that really sent a kind of a chill down the spine of Democrats. And I think is part of the reason that Warren, who was, one reason that Warren, who was surging, crested a bit and that, that there's been this solidity of support for Biden, who's considered to be, whether it's correct or not, considered to be the candidate with the best chance of beating Trump in the general election. Yeah. That is also to what extent have they been whitened or mainstreamed enough, or given the kinds of things that Trump said at the at the IAC yeah. convention, uh, bordering and yeah. submitting, yeah. How, would that kind of rhetoric yeah. be um, uh, highlighted? Um, so that's an interesting question, right? So what impact would Bloomberg or Sanders' Jewishness have? We. We don't have any sample size, right, at the presidential level, election level to look at how people respond to Jewish candidates. 
at the congressional level and the gubernatorial level, it doesn't really seem that being Jewish is a particular drag. Jews are overrepresented, um, um, uh, and particularly at the state level. So, for instance, if you, find, if you compare Jews, Jews in politics to African Americans and Latinos, right, at, in the House, where you have more ethnically kind of homogenous districts, right, you find that, that, they're, that they're fairly comparative. But when you go to the state level, right, where obviously there are no states where you have a majority of either Jews or uh, Latinos or African Americans, you find that there are many, many more Jewish senators than there are African American and Latino senators, right? And that's, again, I think because Jews, as most of them white, don't face the same kind of drag. Um, but again, we don't know at the presidential level, right? And I think that when it comes to women candidates, there's some evidence, I think, to suggest that extrapolating from vote from running for governor or senator to running for president uh, is pro very problematic. Um, I think that one of the things that also you have to factor into about Bloomberg and Sanders is not just their Jewishness, but their secularism, right? Um, which is to say, you could make an argument that a bigger problem for both of them, um, and I think back to the problems that Michael Dukakis had, for instance, in 1988, who was actually Greek Orthodox American, but basically very secular, is in some ways the language of American politics tends to be quite Protestant and religious. And if you don't have a religious language, regardless of what religion it is that you're not practicing, I think that can come off as somewhat jarring for, and for some Americans. And I think my guess is that if you did polling, you might find that um, a, a, an American Jew who was more religiously observant, or at least conversant in talking about their religious tradition, might actually do better. Um, particularly among conservative white Christians, uh, and maybe even among uh, uh, religious African Americans, than a secular, uh, a highly secular Jew like Sanders. Uh, I don't think Sanders. I don't think Sanders actually calls himself an atheist, but I do think he. And I think he said the other day that he believes in God, but he certainly has no relationship to organized religion. The interesting thing, the other thing, the other thing to say about it, which would not be the case in, in terms of Bloomberg, but in case of Sanders, which would also be fascinating, is that. Sanders is the candidate that the um, mainstream, the established American Jewish organizations oppose the most, right? He's the one that um, they are most hostile to because he's the one, well, mostly because he's the mo one who is most critical of Israeli policy, um, perhaps also because he's the most left-wing on economics. Um, and I think that you will, one of the fact, the American Jewish community will become, which is already pretty divided, uh, isn't really a community at all. American Jews who were already already divided, I think will become more intensely politically divided when they basically you see may establish an American Jewish organizations essentially attacking the first Jewish nominee for president, which will lead more lefty and younger and secular Jews to be more alien, even more alienated from those institutions than they are today. And I think that'll be a really kind of interesting dynamic to watch. And what I think Trump will say is not it's bad that Sanders is Jewish. I think what he'll say is Sanders isn't really Jewish, right? I mean, and you already are seeing versions of this, right? So you see a commentator like Ben Shapiro, right? Oftentimes, part of what Trump says tends to say about left-leaning Jews often echoes what right-leaning Jews say about left-leaning Jews, right? So um, Ben Shapiro recently said that Sanders was nominally Jewish, right? Whatever the heck that means, right? You saw that Rudy Giuliani recently said in an interview in New York Magazine that I'm more Jewish than George Soros is, right? Again, what the heck that means, but it's basically a way of saying that if you're not religious and you're not sufficiently pro-Israel, whatever that means, that therefore you're not really Jewish. And this is a whole different topic, but because, especially on the American right, Israel is seen as an idealized vision of the United States that Israel is what many in the American right wish the United States would be in a whole series of ways, to be, be, to be called anti-Israel is to be called anti-American. Um, and so I think in a, way, to, in, in a way, the discourse of being self-hating Jew, anti-Israel, and anti-American kind of merge together. Um... 
Yeah, I mean, I think the, uh, I, it's hard to know what to say about that. I mean, it says, um, I feel like one of the things that I've tried to do, it says in, um, in Masechet Brachot that um, you should make your tongue accustomed to saying, I don't know, so you're not uh, caught up in a web of deceit, right? Um, and I feel like on a question like that, I should probably say, I don't know, partly because the, when you talk about the media, right, it, media is not like uh, hairdressers, like they all go to a convention and they say, we do the same thing, right, just in different places, right? The media, especially with social media, in a way in which everyone is the media, right, is so massive and sprawling that I think that the way different institutions have responded and are responding are completely and utterly different, right? What is true is that the, the, the gate, mainstream media gatekeepers, the New York Times, the mainstream networks, CNN, have much less influence, right? They have much less ability to control the discourse than they used to. Um, and, um, and, and, and it's also, even though they have evolved, right? So if you look at the evolution of the New York Times in the Trump era, it's really quite fascinating. And it's actually, I think, in some ways, just what progressives would have wanted, which is that the New York Times on its news pages has become much more willing than it was uh, in earlier eras, to basically say that something is a lie, that say that something is untrue, right? There's much more of, I would say, a stronger willingness to call out falsehoods, but the technology has become so overwhelming, and the ability, and those institutions have become so discredited among people who are not politically on the left or the center left, that the fact that the Times is doing this ultimately isn't really mattering very much. So, for instance, there was a moment, I don't know any of you saw this just last week, where a CNN reporter um, was walking down the hallway and asked a Republican senator from uh, Arizona named Martha McSally. Interestingly, Martha McSally, a few years ago, was actually considered a reason, somewhat moderate Republican, not someone at all like Trump, but you just see the way in which the culture of Trumpism has completely changed the rules. And so basically, he asked her a totally par of question, like, do you think there should be witnesses at the Senate impeachment trial? And she basically says, I'm not answering, you, I'm not answering your question, liberal hack, right? Um, and then she went on Sean Hannity's show on Fox, basically, to take a kind of victory lap around this, right? So this is part of the reason that in what, I think one of the really depressing things is that even though I think the mainstream institutions, the New York Times and the Washington Post in particular, have responded to Trump in some ways really well. I mean, they've done great reporting. They've broken an enormous amount of news. They have also, I think, been willing to take off the gloves in some really important ways in the news pages and call a lie a lie. If you listen to conservative talk radio, the information that they are uncovering is simply not being conveyed to Trump voters. Um, and so this is part of the problem. The other thing that we are also don't know how to deal with, if you remember, one of the things that happened in 2016 is that there were these hacks of John Podesta's emails and of the Democratic National Committee, and then that was distributed to the press who wrote about it, right? And in so doing, they were essentially doing the work of the Trump campaign and maybe of Vladimir Putin, if you assume that we're going to have that and maybe more of it next time, right? It really, the media, I think, has not, the institutions like the New York Times have not figured out how to handle this, right? If you're given a big news story based on secret documents, you write about it, right? And yet, what do you do if in so doing, you are actually helping a foreign power and one particular political party actually subvert the democratic process? That's charitable, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, with weak uh, early stage uh, polling, uh, considering that he could very well be the nominee, do you think that case holds any water? Uh, I, I, think it's a, I think you are exactly right. I'm not convinced that Biden is such a strong general election candidate. It doesn't mean I'm convinced that we are strong general election candidates. Uh, but, I mean, I think it's certainly easy, possible to imagine that there's a... Look at what happened to Jeremy Corbyn in Britain, right? The, the industrial working class heartlands that were pro-Brexit, right, 
voted for the Tories, even though he was super left-wing economics. And yet, the more upscale, perhaps anti-Brexit voters didn't vote for him, some of them, because he was too far left. I think it's possible that Sanders could fall into that same trap, right? Which is, um, he doesn't win back enough Trump voters, but he is a, in places like the Philadelphia suburbs, let's say, where you have more upscale, let's say, called Romney Republicans, who might have voted for a Democrat in 2018, they either won't, they, they might not vote for Trump, but they won't turn out because uh, Trump's economic, Sanders' economic policies are too threatening. To a, and, and Warren, perhaps, to do, do agree as well, with the added element of gender, which is, I think, a very powerful element in, in presidential elections. Um, but you're right that a Democrat also, in a, also a Democrat needs, you know, why did Hillary Clinton lose? Because African-American turnout, turnout dropped. Youth turnout dropped, right? Can Biden inspire young people to go to the polls? I think the answer is almost certainly not, right? I mean, um, he's an extremely uninspiring candidate for young people in particular. Um, and so I think it's partly a debate about what's more important, mobilizing your base or persuading swing voters. But I think it's possible, you know, Obama was able to do both to a significant degree, right? And I think that there is a real worry that Biden, I think, won't be able to inspire people. And it would be nice to think that people will be inspired just to vote against Donald Trump, right? But in 2016, that turned out not to be the case, actually. That Latino and African American and youth turnout were not high enough. And so I think it's a real concern, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Basically stretching the institutions yeah. to cause what you're calling this kind of politics, the Sanders politics in Congress. On the other hand, of course, the Congress is making the point that they're making sort of an institutionalist attempt to stop the insurrectionist right. forces of uh, right. what the public sort of perception of that yeah. in that respect. What because these boundaries that you set so nicely are kind of blurred in this case because you can see is 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 the Right. Or maybe the institutions are themselves destroying themselves in that respect and becoming so so uh, uh, problematic in, in, in the hearts and minds of some people in America. Yes, no, you're right. And in some ways, both sides are making a uh, um, both sides are appealing to the Constitution, right? Um, which is naturally what you would do in this in this kind of struggle. And so, in some ways, you could say it's an institutionalist argument, and they're both appealing to the authority, right, of this document um, and to the authority of the the founders who who wrote it. Um, I mean, I think what happened uh, in the, the polling shows that, um, you know, the public is basically split on impeachment along partisan lines, basically, right? I mean, um, there, there's a small group of people who don't like Donald Trump who also don't want him removed from office, right? Remember, impeachment and removal are not the same thing. Trump has already been impeached. You get impeached by the House, by a majority vote. To be removed, you need two-thirds in the Senate, right? Which is very, very unlikely. Um, but um, what we saw was that basically, once Democrats decided to get behind impeachment and push for impeachment, virtually all the Democrats moved to supporting impeachment, and it became basically a partisan divide, um, uh, which is the, and it was, you know, in that, even if you compare it to the vote back for Bill Clinton, which was along partisan lines, in, 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 the, in the House, there was not a single Republican who voted for impeachment, right? And there were only two Democrats, I think, who voted against it. So you see how strong, I mean, this is one of the really dramatic shifts in American life since I was a kid, right? Which is to say, partisan identity has become so much stronger as almost a definition of who you are, right? I mean, when I was growing up, and I think it's, I don't know, it's almost, it's a whole other topic, but the question of how partisanship has, become, has eclipsed other things may also partly be the fact that other kinds of identities have become less salient, right? Like, when I was growing, America's become less religious. Religious identity has become less significant. Some of the old ethnic identities have become less, much less important. When I was growing up in Boston in the 1970s and 80s, and you still had some liberal Republicans, right? The kind of old WASP, liberal Republican tradition that was embodied at one, like Bush family, right, originally, in places like Massachusetts and Connecticut. And you had a lot of very socially conservative Catholic Democrats in Boston who were anti-abortion, I mean, anti, virulently anti-gay rights, 
very right wing on racial issues too. To be a liberal and a Democrat was not synonymous. To be a Republican and conservative was not synonymous. And I also think that a lot of people that I knew and thought about, for them being Irish American or Italian American uh, or Catholic was more important than being a Democrat or Republican. I feel like in some ways as those old ethnic identities and religious identities have waned a little bit, that the parties have become these surrogate identities that now kind of dominate identity more. And so um, the, what happened was you had the Democratic leadership, Nancy Pelosi, who is more institutionalist, didn't want to go for impeachment, right? Thought it would be politically problematic. But the Ukraine, the Ukraine story and the willingness of even Democratic members of the House who had been elected from swing districts to get behind that, I think made her feel like it would not, they would not provoke the political backlash that she feared. And I, it appears that she's been right, that although it's not benefiting the Democrats to be pushing for impeachment, polling-wise, there's not evidence that it's hurting them. Although I did hear, interestingly, someone make the point interesting the other day, that although Trump has not getting, gotten, a, gotten a polling bounce as a push for impeachment, his fundraising numbers have really spiked. That he's been, they've been very effective in using this to fundraise, and Trump has, has an astonishing amount of money. This is part of the reason Democrats really need Bloomberg so much to continue to spend in the general election, because otherwise they may really be outmatched. And so in that way, you can say that impeachment has helped Trump a little bit. Which I don't possess, but... I mean, right, my powers of prognostication about what happens in the Republican Party are particularly poor, right? Um, uh, I would say, the, I, would say the, I think the most likely thing would be that if Trump loses, you have an attempt by certain people to kind of, uh, for a kind of new fusionism, which essentially takes elements of traditional Republican politics and Trumpism and tries to put them together. So I think that it, the next, if you look, and if you look at the most likely candidates, Tom Cotton, Nikki Haley, Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, I think what you see is that they will be quite anti-immigration, that that will be the new normal, and they will be more skeptical of free trade than previous Republicans were, um, but that they will be you know, less erratic, right, obviously in various ways than Trump, and probably maybe in some ways have a more, um, a more typical hawkish foreign policy, you know, American Enterprise Institute kind of thing, rather than Trump, which kind of blends elements of that with, blend, with elements of kind of apparent isolationism and also just kind of Trumpian insanity, right? Um, so I think that would be the natural thing. And I think what the Republicans will increasingly try to congeal around will be China and the China threat, right? And the China threat is what will allow them to to be, be the fig leaf for them to dispose of the free trade ideology. You're already seeing this. You know, it might have been fine to be free trade. Maybe it's okay to have free trade with uh, France or Norway, but not with China, right? And I think China allows you to be nationalistic, right? Uh, and also be hawkish in foreign policy, right? And I think China will be the place. You already see people like Cotton and Rubio focusing a lot on China. I also wouldn't be surprised if the shoe that has not yet dropped, which I really worry about, in American politics, in this cycle of nativism that we're seeing is anti-Chinese and anti-Asian sentiment. Um, there's already, I think, a lot that's happening in terms of McCarthyism towards Chinese American scholars and, and students on American campuses in the name of the, 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 you know, the, the kind of fifth column of the Chinese spying in the United States. So I think that would be the most likely way of trying to find a fusion. On the other hand, you know, it's also possible that Tucker Carlson runs for president, you know, or that Eric Trump, you know, Donald Trump Jr., I mean, God help us, right, runs for president. So it's like Trump, Trump has shared the template that it may be that other people see that as an opportunity and, and jump in, um, and maybe even, you know, they're able to, they're able to follow that, that template.
Right, right. To what extent is institutional instability really uh, in, the, in the cards? Yeah, I think, I think you're, you're, you're making a very good point. I don't think that I, I'm meant to suggest that I think these things are likely to happen. I simply think that the fact that they are already now being discussed and I think would become um, more mainstream liberal democratic positions will itself suggest that there's been a kind of a legitimization crisis that exists. I mean, so for instance, one way of thinking about it is what happens on the day after if we get to a point where the conservative Supreme Court overturns Roe versus Wade, for instance, right? Like, I, will people, will people, will that lead to a change in the Supreme Court? No, not in the short term. Will people burn the Supreme Court down? No, I don't think that's likely either. But I do think there is a growing on the, among both conservatives and liberals, Democrats and Republicans, there's a growing sense that these institutions for various reasons are not legitimate. Um, and I think that you will see that grow on the left. How it expresses itself, what, what people can actually do about it, I'm not really sure. I mean, I do think we are in a moment of either a rise of, of fairly high progressive kind of grassroots activism um, that we haven't, you know, probably the, the highest that we've seen since the 1960s. Um, and I think climate change will only continue to be one of the things that accelerates that. So again, I think, I don't think it's impossible to imagine, if you think about the Occupy movement, right, which I actually think turned out to, I think, be an enormously significant movement, not because of what it's achieved, but because it was in some ways a harbinger, it, it essentially downstream from Occupy is the election of Bill de Blasio, uh, the rise of Bernie Sanders, right, those impulses, which I, I think, you, and, you know, there was a moment at Occupy where I think one third of the cities in the United States had Occupy movements, right? I think you could imagine some new, something detonates and some huge new mass movement, right? Would it ultimately succeed in making those institutional reforms? I agree. Probably unlikely. Maybe, you know, the goal for people on the left is maybe you can, like FDR did in some ways, maybe you can scare people enough so that people in the establishment will move politically because of the fear of some kind of disruption. You know, that was in some ways what FDR was able to do with the threat of people like Huey Long to his left and the CIO. In some ways, King was able to do that with the threat of racial conflict. And I think in some ways, what progressives probably need in this era, if they're going to actually make significant change, is the threat of left-wing disruption or populist left disruption, which then they can say, you know what, we can actually be the thing, people that can hold things together. Right, right. So that's a good question. Um, uh, so, I mean, you are right that there is a, um, there, are, there are ways in which the insurrectionist wings of the Republican and Democratic Party policy agree in the sense that 
the, you know, the foreign policy establishment is more bipartisan um, and also more insulated from popular pressures, right? Um, and so there's, there's this kind of hostility to, to, bo to, to, to it on both the left, the insurrection side, the Democratic and Republican Party, and the person. You can see that reflected sometimes by Tucker Carlson, right, who, in, you know, is pretty odious, but also pretty interesting, or certainly more interesting than the other hosts at Fox. And sometimes he will have on, um, be, because he is very anti-interventionist, right, and so he will have on sometimes left wing, he's had on Stephen Cohen, right, the, 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 the histor Russian historian from Princeton, or Glenn Greenwald on sometimes, right. Um, now, there is a fundamental moral difference in the moral justification, right? For Sanders, basically, fundamentally, the reason that we should not be intervening in the Middle East, let's say, is because basically these people aren't worth our time and energy and blood, right? Basically, they're too primitive to, uh, in the Arab and Muslim world, to basically be able to make any of themselves, so we shouldn't bother trying to, to kind of civilize them, right? That's essentially his view, right? I mean, the left-wing perspective is different, right? It's actually that if we got out of their way and practicing imperialism, they might actually have a chance to to kind of flourish. Um, so there's a, there, there's a difference in that kind of moral undertone, um, but there are definite agreements. And, and t Carlson, I mean, it's a facet, it's, Carlson seems to actually have played a significant role at a couple of moments in the Trump administration in basically telling Trump, and, you know, it's, I mean, American politics is very weird, but part of the way people talk to Trump is through TV, right? They literally talk to Trump through the TV. And one of the things that Carlson has told him repeatedly during this Iran crisis is your voters don't want a war with Iran. Don't do this. The people, it's the never Trumpers who wanted that war with Iran, not you. And, and I think he's had some kind of impact. Um, there, and, and we see, actually, you know, one of the interesting institutions that emerged recently in Washington is this think tank called the Quincy Institute, right, which was funded by the Koch brothers, who are pretty anti-interventionist, uh, libertarian, and Soros, right? Um, and um, they, but, you know, and there are certain issues like Iran, let's say, where they can they can come to terms. What, the one big challenge for any trans ideological par pairing like that on foreign policy is climate change, right? Because for Democrats now, climate change is essentially the most important issue in foreign policy, right? And and the answer is new networks of regulation, new institutions, and libertarians are not sympathetic to that, right? Um, even on trade, right? Even though the left wing, the the insurrections of both sides might oppose have post NAFTA, post trade deals, their ultimate vision is very different, right? What Sanders and Warren are ultimately gesturing to are things like some kind of global minimum wage, right? Some very thick new set of institutionalized arrangements with strict worker environmental rights all around the world, right? That's not what the Republican anti-trade insurrectionists want, right? They basically just want kind of nationalist, uh, nationalist economics. So, um, but yeah, there are some interesting things happening in that regard. Right, right, right. I mean, I, I think that, um, so, you know, some of the political scientists who've worked on this have really focused on um, the increasal, increasing racial sorting of the two parties, right? Um, which particularly was activated by Obama, right? That, um, that um, and, and, and now it's just kind of interesting. Uh, so you used to have, the Rockefeller Republicans were pretty liberal or at least moderate on race, right? And they tended to be often generally from the North, right? And you had a lot of, segregationist Democratic senators, right? As the two parties have really sorted, um, particularly on the question of race, right? And the political science of doing this interesting research just shows how strongly racial attitudes are predictors of e views on even issues that wouldn't appear to be racial um, on, uh, um, on the surface. I think that those, those moderate Republicans 
basically haven't had a place in a, in a Republican Party, which has become increasingly defined by its race, I mean, if you want to be nice about it, it's conservatism. And then the other thing which has happened, sorry, um, um, in addition to the, the politics in, in response to African Americans, there's been this new sorting based on views of immigrants, right, particularly Latinos, which was not the case. If you go back to even the race between Obama and John McCain in 2008, you see that they, their views about immigration were not that different. And the immigration was not a strongly cross-partisan issue, right? But, but now you're seeing that it's become more and more a partisan issue and that Republican attitudes on Latinos have become basically more and more mirroring Republican attitudes towards race vis-a-vis -vis African Americans. And there's another reason, I think, that, that, Ro that, that kind of Rom Rockefeller Republicans who would have been more pro-immigration have felt like they don't have a home in the party. Right. So the question is about the anti-Semitic elements of the Democratic Party and how it will play out. So I think part of the challenge is that we don't necessarily have a consensus definition in the American political system or even among American Jews about what constitutes anti-Semitism. Right? So I think that there's one wing of American political discourse and of the Jewish community that essentially says um, uh, boycotting Israel, yes movement, and any questioning of the legitimacy of Zionism or Jewish statehood, right, um, is, is anti-Semitic, right? And if that, if you take that definition, I don't, but let's just take that definition, um, then you would see growing anti-Semitism in the Democratic Party because the, um, although it's still, because if you look at polling, you find that actually a majority of Democrats now would support some form of economic sanctions against Israel for its policies. Um, and um, we now have two Democratic members of the Congress, still not many, but there used to be zero, now there are two, Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar, who support boycott divestment sanction. And as the two-state solution fades, um, and Americans come more to terms with a long-term one-state reality, it is probably likely that Americans on the left will be more drawn to the idea of a secular binational state rather than one state in which millions of Palestinians live uh, without, per, without citizenship under military law or in Gaza under blockade. So I think that, and the polling is, we don't really have a lot of polling now, but it's interesting. And this is true in the Jewish community. So if you ask American Jews, are you Zionists? I think the poll I saw said 95% say yes, right? But I suspect if you asked American Jews this question, would, would, are, would you prefer one state in which millions of Palestinians lack basic rights or one equal state that is not a Jewish state, you would actually find that the division was much different than 95 to 5, right? So in that sense, yes. If that's what you consider anti-Semitism, yes, that I think is growing. Anti-Zionism, or at least more skepticism about Zionism, more willing to put pressure on Israel through boycotts and other things. Um, if what you mean by anti-Zionism is, um, is something different, um, is kind of um, uh, a kind of hostility that he also expressed towards Jews per se, right, then I think there is still some of it. Um, uh, there are rising, there are growing numbers of anti-Semitic attacks that we are seeing um, in the United States, and some of that is coming from communities where most people vote Democratic, African-American communities, although what the political character of that is, I think, is hard to quite understand. And there hasn't been, I think, the kind of reporting that yet and data to really understand what's happening yet. And yet I think that if that's what you mean by anti-Semitism, there's less, right? And there's some evidence, I think, from polling that, um, that if you ask, if you look at the category of Americans who are most likely to express anti-Zionist opinions, um, they are not that they are not the group of Americans that are most likely to tell pollsters that Jews control the media, that Jews uh, have too much power, that Jews stick together, right? That these are actually two separate groups of population. The most anti-Zionist Americans tend to be young and highly educated. The, Ameri the people who are most likely to give answer yes to those stereotypically anti-Semitic questions tend to be older and poorly educated. 